since I'm here and I'm doing the things that I have to do, I would say like my mentor would have to be my gay daughter because without her, I think like she pushes me like to want to do better. Like when I see her and I think that I know everything and she makes me realize like um, what you see in yourself, you see in somebody else, she makes me realize like, like you could do so much better. Like don't be like the rest of the transgender women. You don't have to go do that. And she just motivates me. Like when I think of just turning back, she always makes sure she gives me that, that extra push when I need it. So my mentor would have to be my gay daughter. Thank you. <clears throat> um, typically in the um, gay subculture, um, when you come out the closet, um, you usually are assigned what they call gay parents. And your gay parents, somehow the universe brings them to you. You're going to get them. <laughs> and, and it, for instance, in my um, case, um, I was issued a gay father by the name of Hassan Robinson. Um, I knew absolutely nothing about ballroom scenes or gay life or the village or Project Wow, anything until I met this young man. Um, I was I was pretty I was in pretty need help. I was pretty in need up for help. And he gave me the help that I needed. He um, told me the ins and outs and didn't judge me of the things I did do, but told me how to ration myself so it won't be so out there. And like, tell me how to moderate this and how to speak and proper etiquette and the whole fashion thing. And so people don't talk about me because I was always depressed about, oh, why everybody always talk about me? And he was like, no, no, just don't worry about it. Just, but if you're going to do it, do it this way. And I really appreciate that. Um, aside from that, it's like, so many people who I idolize, and I have to make mention of them, like um, Rodney Long, who is someone who I see, who I've seen since I came out, just dodging in and out the community or somewhere where I've been, just giving, 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 not taking. And I'm just like, oh wow, awesome. And then we have your Darnell Moores, who's just, you know, someone who I aspire to be, who's taking that extra step in everything he does, and have I, words can't explain. Um, Ralston Blair, who was one of the many counselors at Project WOW, who knew what was in me before I did and continued to push me even though I refused it a lot of the times. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, Tamara Fleming, oh, I love your photography. I mean, that's who, <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I can go on, but um, I'm gonna stop there. So my mentor definitely was my counselor at Project WOW, my gay dad. <laughs> it is not a coincidence that many of the names that were just mentioned are in the audience right now, so that deserves a round of applause. Give another shout out. I don't know how I could forget Darnell. I just want to give him another round of applause. <laughs> yeah, I feel so ashamed of myself for forgetting this man. Um, who, who came into my life my senior year in high school, who I met in this very room um, um, at this very table. Um, I was invited to speak about um, LGBT concerns um, in Newark's education system um, with a conference that was organized by Darnell. And um, when the universe brought us together, uh, there had just been great beautiful things that have happened since then. Um, and yeah, this man has truly been like an inspiration, a mentor, a friend, a brother, a sister, a brista, as we say. <laughs> um, just a wonderful person. Shout out to the annual Safe Spaces Conference. Look out soon for a date near <laughs> you. So let's talk a little bit about religion and the role that religion, if it had, played a role in your life and in your family's life and you, any affiliations that you have now, um, and any conflicts that may have emerged. Let me start with Terrell. OK. Um, well, like I may mention earlier, my mom was Muslim, and my grandma was Christian. Um, so I went from church to reading the Quran and kind of flip-flopped a lot, mainly because I wanted acceptance from both of them. Um, <coughs> At the end of the day, <laughs> I think I came to terms with just believing in a higher power. And I believe that living in that type of chaotic situation, what it did teach me is how Eli is to not judge people on different religions and things like that, because they would go back and forth about how this is right and this is wrong. And 
I just sit in the middle like, well, why can't we do this and compromise and bada bing, bada boom, everybody's happy. And they'd be like, oh. And then, so it, like, that's, that, that, that's the one thing it taught me by living under a roof with like so many different religions. Um, currently, I'm now a Christian. <laughs> so, and I'm really, I'm really happy with that. Um, so I currently don't identify with an organized religion. I do um, identify as, you know, sort of a spiritual person who believes in a hodgepodge of a bunch of different new age stuff. But um, I was raised, my mother was never really religious at all. Um, but um, my grandmother comes from Southern Baptist Church. Um, and so for a while, I. Um, I did go to church with her, but when I went to church with her, church taught me how to be gay. Um, and we all know, we all know, you know, when, um, <laughs> when you look at the choir and, you know, um, <laughs> the, the dudes in the choir singing higher than the girls, everyone accepts and embraces them. You know, they may be, what you call them, a little, a little funny or, oh, he different, but, you know, people collectively accept in their own coded words that that person is gay. And so I, um, just the flamboyancy of uh, the African-American Baptist tradition really resonated with me. Like I would go to church and I would just like really sit there, like the preacher would be preaching, I wasn't really listening, I was just like looking around the room, clocking what everybody was wearing. <laughs> they, were, they, they, they brought out some fierce fits for church. So um, until I got older and got bored with church, that was sort of what I uh, appreciated. And then my, um, a couple of my uncles are Muslim, so I practiced Islam for a while. Um, but then when I started to just question organized religion, um, I stopped believing in uh, sort of, yeah, an organized religion um, and sort of wanted to get away from these religious ideologies and doctrines. Um, that said I shouldn't exist. Um, and so I had a friend who was Buddhist. I tried that for a minute. Um, didn't really work for me. Um, and something that actually resonated with me from the, early, the earlier panels uh, that would really uh, sort of describe my religion um, is that uh, self-love is sort of what I believe as in, in the religion, which a lot of the pan, uh, panelists earlier spoke about. And I truly believe that inside each and every one of us, we have a love, a beauty, a god, a goddess that we need to remember and embrace um, and share with other people. And we can't find that externally. You know, We can't find that in another man, another woman, from a friend. Um, from a place, from an item of clothing, we really have to find that in each and every one of ourselves because we have it in us. And everything that we do in life should reflect that and should help us bring out that inner beauty so that we can you know, share it with, with each other. So that's my religion. All right. Um, my Facebook says, that, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> it says that I'm like a follower of Christ with Buddhist tendencies, some Islam reservations, <laughs> like, and like a spiritual quest or journey or something like that with like an understanding of like good and evil and the marriage of like heaven and hell or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't actually have like a problem with religion until I found out that religion sort of had a problem with me. That was my like word, word book. <laughs> see, if, see if I don't have an issue when it comes to the sanctuary, but whatever. Um, so like that wasn't my issue. Like when I was younger and stuff like that, like I would like pretend like I was a preacher and everything like that. And it was really good times. The issue came in when like I came out and my parent, like I came out, and when I came out, like my sister, like they found out my sister was like sexually active, and they threw us both in the church, like ah, uh -uh. Jesus help them. And like <laughs> they threw me into the church, and like I went with rainbow belts on every Sunday, and like 
Like, it was, it was not a game. Like, me and, like, this um, other AG at the time, like, her, uh, when she went to church events, like, she was dressed like a boy. But when she went to church, her grandmother made her dress like a girl. So, like, after church, she would be really pissed off because she'd have these white stockings on and this skirt and this ugly blouse and barrettes. And, like, I looked older, so we would walk down. I would go get a Lucy, and we'd walk up and down smoking, like, trying to look cool and everything like that, you know? Because, of course, I had, like, this really cool, like, knee-length, like, chocolate jacket that went with my only tan outfit that I wore to church. <laughs> and made me look so much older when I wore it. But anyway. Um, and, like, my parents tried to take me to Bible study and everything. And I remember that they took me to Bible study. And... We got on like Sodom and Gomorrah, Levitical Code, whatever. And I was like, so you believe being gay is wrong. So you're telling me I could be a good person. I can, you know, help others, you know what I'm saying? Love my neighbor like I love myself. And you're telling me that I'm still gonna go to hell because of how I love. And like the women who were in my all women's Bible study group said yes. And I promptly got back into the car with my mom and I said, if you take me back to this Bible study again, we can't come back to this church. And since I was known for being like the reckless one that will take a beating just to make a point, like and to embarrass people, oh, I will embarrass you. Don't make me embarrass you. Like when I, like, when I came out, that's when I really got to say that to my parents and mean it. Don't make me embarrass you, okay? Like, there are gay people here. I can find them. Don't make me, <laughs> you know? And they made me go back to church and promptly, you know what I'm saying, at the church field trip to gay day, I mean, to, to the gospel fest at Six Flags, I dang sure found the other gay people. You know, we were all at the back of the bus and we all came out. Like, it was smiles and giggles the entire time. So, um, <laughs> I, was, I was more or less like a terror in church. Um, and then I went on uh, the Equality Ride, which was a, um, a social justice bus tour through the South where we went to uh, conservative faith-based institutions to speak to them about their discriminatory policies um, towards their um, LGBTQ students. And that's when like, the religion conversation didn't, it wasn't like religion, this is something that someone is using against me. It was like religion, this is like a doctrine that people believe in that has caused like, an, irreparable damage and pain to members of my community. I can't, I can't, I need to learn, I need to know more about this work. I need to know why I can go to one church and talk to one pastor and they say one thing and I can go to another church, I talk to another pastor, they say something totally different. Um, and that's when it was like using the Bible to heal where others have like hurt and screwed people up. Like when I met like an ex-gay like face to face, like it was the most emotional. I, I, I've never cried so much. Just understanding that like somebody made a choice to not be the fullness of who they are and like how crushing that is to your soul because you're really like, these are all of my friends. Like imagine these are all of your friends, but you understand that the reason they're your friends is because you're not out. It's because you have chosen to live a life that's normal, that other people can swallow and accept. And I was just like, I mean, I did my uh, jumping around with religion um, in terms of, yeah, I did the Quran, I did Buddhism, everything, but I, I was drawn back to Christianity because I feel like it's not being taught the way it's supposed to be. And if that is going to have people start businesses, like not nonprofits, like businesses, making billions of dollars just so that they can bring ski slopes in, not so that the kids can have like snow and you know, a new form of recreation, no. They wanna bring that in so they have more kids to come to their school, so they can teach them more of like their, lessons of hate and intolerance. And I'm just like, I'm over it. I'm sorry. Like, and that's kind of one of the things like, 
I don't necessarily see myself as like, this is the Bible, it's the word, breathed, everything. But I do understand like, this is an awesome book of stories that has been used to inspire people. And if you look at it from its historical and its cultural context, you find a greater understanding of what the word revolution means, a greater understanding of who Jesus was in the context of that time and, and forever and all. And you understand that the Bible, Jesus, love, revolution, let's make change happen. Let's speak truth to power. Let's like show the hypocrisy of their laws and be like, you know what? You're in a financial crisis right now, but you're saying that gay people can't be married. You understand how much of a marketing boom there would be if gay people can get married? Hello? We'd put the business to shame. We would like single-handedly flip this economy, but they don't want our money because, because you know what I'm saying, of what we do in like closed doors, but they want our fashion advice. They want our, you know what I'm saying, they want us to be there to, I'm so lonely and straight, my gay man, hold me. <laughs> Take me around your brothers, you know, type of thing. You know, they want to be around dykes who are just like, yes, yes, you're a straight woman. I've been in love with you for the past four years. You know this, but, you're still gonna hang out with me for your ego boost and stuff like that. But, you know, and you only say, hey, I got a gay friend. That doesn't mean I'm homophobic. Yes, it does. <laughs> if you have to say that you have a gay friend to tell somebody that you're not homophobic, you're a freaking pretty shitty homophobe, sir. <laughs> I appreciate the homophobes that don't, you know what I'm saying, like, fucks with us. They just, like, they back up, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, so, <laughs> wrapping that up, so I had all that to say, religion. Tool to heal. That's my take on it. <laughs> um, I would like to say that growing up in like a Christianity home, I would have to say like the church was like a safe place. I forgot to leave that out. Cause like all my sisters was in church. We was like six and seven. We used to know what time to meet up to go downstairs when the pastor was about to preach or whatever. So I basically wanted to be like, um, yeah, like, church was, like, basic, like, um, my grandmother, she made me go to church every Sunday. It wasn't no yes, it wasn't no no. It was, like, go. Close out Saturday night, blizzard, church. She didn't care. <laughs> if we were sleeping in church, she didn't care. Her main thing was to look good, everybody, church. So we basically was just church stuff. I used to get dressed. I used to never want to buy new dress clothes because every year they get smaller and smaller. So I used to be, I just used to go and go and go and go. And then one day she noticed, like, me and this boy, we just started hanging together. Like, she just used to watch and she used to say, why you hang out with Miss Jerry, little grandson? I say, he's my friend. She said, yeah, he look like he's going to be gay. And I say, why do you say that? And then she said, yeah, because you're going to be gay too, I bet you. And I used to be like, oh. And I used to be like, um, and I used to be like, no, 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 no. So then one year, like, she knew, like, at the summer camp, she knew, like, they was going to teach, like, a certain lesson. I guess the pastor already, because they was, like, going to ministry board. So I guess the pastor knew, like, to send, like, the young boys to, like, this little church, little retreat thing or whatever. And um, they were talking about, like, how gays getting, like, it was, like, an abomination against Christ and all that stuff. But um, it never occurred to me that I never thought of myself as being gay. Like Natalie said earlier, she always looked at herself as being a woman. So therefore, it's like, I always took myself out the equation because I was like, um, them faggots. I'm not a faggot. <laughs> so, so it never, like, so, like, it never, so, like, I never looked at it like it was, like, harm in me. Like, I was like, them are two men. And so as I never felt these so, like, if I was, like, like, still to this day, I don't go to, I don't like the village, because I don't like to see too, like, too many, really. So therefore, like, in church, I never used to, like, understand, like, I used to see, like, the guys, and I used to see them, like, sinking and stuff, and I used to wonder, like, are they going to be girls like me? And I used to always think, but then I realized, like, no, them are, like, gay men. So basically, church to me was, like, another home. Like, I used to get up, and I used to, like, oh, let's go to church, let's go to church. And my brother was like, you want to go to church so much? Why you want to go to church so much? Because I knew, like, joining the choir in the back, you see all the people like you going on a little trips to church to give, all the, you, all the boys stay in one room and stuff. You know, but, you know, but, it, so... It was basically, it was basically like, um, it was basically like after like finding out, like as I got older, or whatever, and I started seeing it, like I started seeing church different, cause like my grandmother, she just started talking all this, I was bringing my gay friends around, they bull daggers, the lesbians and stuff. She don't want them bull daggers in, and I was like, but some of them go to church, and so she, so she, um, so she stopped going to the church too, cause she found out that um, I was talking to one of the people that was like the big people of the church. And I had ended up telling her the wrong thing to do. She unleft the church and everything. So I was, 
So I would just would say that um, religion, it doesn't matter like who you cho- like who you choose to call God. Even if you believe in yourself, like you said, that if it's a God or God is in you. I think the thing is that just to have faith and just believe, you know, that's my main thing of religion. Just have faith and believe. So we listened to the baby boom generation panel talk about, did I hear all right now? Talk about uh, Murphy's and talk about Zanzibar. We heard the middle generation talk about going to New York City and seeing Murphy's and Zanzibar close. Here in Newark today, where does the LGBT youth community go to have fun, places and spaces to party, um, to get entertainment? Where are the spaces now here in Newark? Is it the Raven now? Mm-hmm. I thought I would. I probably called it the Raven. The brownstone. Don't whisper now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we trying to figure out like term. It, it was the, the globe, but then it changed. I thought to the Raven, and then it the was the globe. What is the brownstone? Never. I thought it was the globe. I think it's still the globe. I don't know. The brownstone. The brownstone. You sure? Yeah, something. That's what it's called. The brownstone. Oh, okay. Right. I think the you brownstone. can call it either or. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's called. Mm-hmm. The brownstone, <laughs> aka yeah. the globe. It's like Omar. You know what I'm saying when, when Nick's was open, I would I would go and I would I would mingle, mm. get a drink, <laughs> I would dance a little bit. I might even get a number. I just <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where to go now. Can you talk about Nick's a little bit. <laughs> what is Nick's? Um, Nick's had Nick's is a spot on Central, and it had a Central Avenue, and it had Gay Night on Fridays. Yes, clap if you've been there. I seen you. <laughs> but like that was that was like the swaggy house music and stuff like that. Just awesome lesbians, most sometimes in couple form without any type of couple indicator, but that's okay. I just, I just remember going there and, you know, kind of doing the trial and error. I'm going to, you're going to walk to the bar by yourself. You're not going to walk to the bar with your butch. I'm going to try to buy you a drink, try to start that conversation. And then when I give them the money for the drink, I'm here with my, with my boo. Thank you, since you and her enjoy that drink. Um, <laughs> I'm thankful though because you know the, I went to Nick's and uh, I got to experience a whole bunch of beautiful lezzies and I went there with mm-hmm. some gay men and that was good times too. Shut that place down and uh, yeah, good times. Nick's, Jew, where are we going now? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, show up on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> um. I was a very big fan of Mentors, um, The Globe, and when I wanted to do things that were of age, Project Wow, you know, like Spades and things. Um, nowadays, I will say, as far <clears throat> as the youth is concerned, when it comes to partying and things like that, there's not a lot of spaces that can accommodate all the different types of gays. <laughs> so. <laughs> What will happen is each individual clique of gays will probably do their own shindig and probably do what they would do, a hotel party or a friend's house and turn that into the atmosphere that they would want so they don't have to be around so many other things that they have to get adjusted to. So um, that's, that's what, what's been going on a lot lately. So Robert Treat, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> that was the place. Yeah. Holla, just call it, holla. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna make it happen. <laughs> um, I never really found a place in Newark to party. (laughs) Like, you know, um, the pier, Christopher Street, those are like, you know, iconic landmarks and, you know, like gay mythology when you're from this area. (laughs) But it's like a myth now because of like the gentrification that's happened. I remember the first time I went to, when I was in high school, we would go to the pier and there would be no one there but us. Or, you know, we'd walk up and down Christopher Street, we wouldn't see too many people. Like, if you're not of age, you know, um, and you don't have access to like bars and clubs, it's like really nowhere to go. But um, I've now had the chance to, um, I've had the chance to experience Chi Chi's, ooh, experience Chi Chi, before they shut it down. Um, you know, secrets isn't that big of a secret. <laughs> you know where secrets at. Um, uh, a lot of gay clubs and bars in New York. 
Um, well, like years ago, I used to party at the Globe when it was like on Broad Street or whatever. But like now, like the trans community, we made me go to the pacemaker on Lines Avenue, the strip club. So Sorry, it's pretty interesting. Are you yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk later. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, I just wanted like, uh, I don't know. I remember like watching kind of gay movies and like um, straight movies and stuff like that, and kind of just like imagining and kind of wishing for like this big beautiful queen to come and kind of see me walking down Christopher Street or in the village or something like that, and like sweep me up with like a fabulous line and like a hair flip and shit, and kind of just like introduce me to like the gay clubs and stuff like that and kind of like be my ticket in because it's like if you don't have a fake ID or somebody to get a fake ID from because Valley Fair closed, like you really, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like you really are kind of just at the mercy of whatever party you can find on like Downlink or something like that or like whatever social networking thing they on it now because I don't go on Downlink anymore. <laughs> Too many bad experiences. But anyway, um, and I feel like that in itself is kind of like that breaks it off because it's kind of like I remember hearing um, from other gay people like gay youth and or young adults and stuff like that like they were kind of taken those places by their like older gay friends or like to be mentors and stuff like that. And they kind of were introduced to the safe way to enjoy the gay scene and the not so safe way to enjoy the gay scene and everything like that. Hmm? That's a lot. Drugs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, I'm sorry, plug, my bad. Very smooth, Jay. <laughs>